Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about willing vessels. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah 6 8. And it says this Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word today. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us today. Help us, Lord, to grow stronger in your word and in your grace, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, just as the Lord God Almighty sought in Isaiah's time, sought willing vessels, he is looking today for willing vessels. Isaiah was a willing vessel. When God asked the question, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah, he said, Here I am, send me. Can you get the mute buttons? Sorry. <clears throat> so God is looking for willing vessels. And it isn't just being a willing vessel for a short time, but He's looking for willing vessels that will stay steadfast to the end. There are people who are presented with a gospel, but yet they'll, they'll gravitate to it, but then they'll soon gravitate toward a perversion of the gospel message. And this isn't new. Look here in, in uh, Galatians 1, 5 through 7, where he says, I marvel that ye so soon remove from him who called you through the grace uh, of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and who would pervert the gospel of Christ. So here in the book of Galatians, Paul, he was rebuking those who had come to a life of faith, but then yet moved uh, to another gospel, which he said is not another, it's just simply one that is perverted. The Galatians were moved away from a life of faith to seeking a life of perfection in the works of the law. Today we seem to have a church that's preaching another gospel, which is not another. They use the same name, right? They use the same jargon, but different priorities. So we moved away from the words of Jesus Christ to a gospel of ease, comfort, and excess. The gospel that requires nothing from us. God does all the saving, and you don't have to really do anything. Just say the simple prayer, uh, and that's all you need to do. Uh, but that isn't what the words of Jesus had to say, just as Brian had alluded to earlier uh, in what he was saying. Here's the question. Do you have a desire to follow Christ? There are those that were in Jesus' day that had this desire, but how many know that desire isn't enough? It takes more than just having any willing desire. Those who desire to follow Christ, but they lack the fortitude to finish the course. So look at these encounters here in the book of Luke. Luke 9, 57, And it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds have, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now here comes a person who proclaims that he will follow Jesus everywhere he goes. And look how Jesus responded. He was very careful not to promise him great riches or a life of comfort, did he? Actually, Jesus alluded to the fact that there were times that animals actually had it better than he did. You know, he, he, and I want to be careful to say that it doesn't mean that everyone who serves the Lord must live in this abject poverty. But at the same time, Jesus doesn't promise everyone that serves him that they will have wealth and prosperity in this life. So when considering our service to the Lord, we are instructed to make these uh, some, some considerations. Look here in Luke 14, 28. He says, Which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? At least after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Here he says, What king, uh, going to make war against another king, doesn't sit down first to consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes with him with 20,000? Or else, while 
The other is still a great way off. He sends a delegation and asks the conditions of peace. He says, so likewise, who doesn't, whoever of you who doesn't forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. To be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be willing to forsake all to serve him. And these are not easy words. And these are not the words that oftentimes when you turn on the television to watch the televangelist, these are not the words that you're hearing. But these are the words that are in red. Not on that screen. <laughs> in the Bible, these are the words of Jesus Christ. And it's what He says matters and we should consider it. But sometimes we want to move away from those teachings because those teachings might push somebody away. And we got to be the gospel of inclusion. Include everybody. Come in. We don't want to preach too hard because that might make people want to go away. But let me tell you something. Jesus wasn't begging anybody to follow Him. He was telling them the truth. Forsaking all doesn't entail just, just forsaking wealth or things. More important than forsaking wealth or things is your own will. That's what we have to forsake that no longer am I the God of my life, but I have to forsake my way of thinking. When Jesus says for us to, you know, to forsake all, He's not talking, like I say, just about to, to the wealthy. He's talking to every single one of us. Having things in and of themselves isn't bad. As a matter of fact, He takes great pleasure in blessing us. However, when those things become more important than knowing Him, they become a stumbling block in our life. We all must from time to time check our hearts on those things. The words of Jesus certainly sound different, like I say, than the gospel that you hear today. And here you must count the cost. And Jesus tells these people up front. Jesus didn't, the first guy that came up to him didn't say, Jesus didn't say, hey, follow me. What did he do? He was so willing. He says, Jesus, I'll follow you everywhere you go. Jesus didn't call him, but let he... He took it upon himself to say, hey, I, I'm going to follow you. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to do whatever, it, whatever he asks of us? Are we committed to serving him? And we have to be honest with ourselves. How many will say to Jesus, I will forsake all to follow you, Jesus? But they won't tithe. And I think... If you can't forsake 10%, how are you going to forsake, the, forsake your life to follow Him? You know? And, 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 you know, I don't talk about tithing a lot. and It isn't just about the money. But I'm just saying that but when, when people start getting to the point where you, you look at the, the sacrifice that you have to make, He isn't just saying 10%. Every single thing that I have belongs to Him. Everything. Here's another, back in Luke 9. Jesus says to this one, He says to another, follow me. But He said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. So Jesus is the one that calls this person, follow me. And it's interesting Jesus made the greatest call on this person's life. Can you imagine what this person neglected? Could you imagine standing before the king of kings in the day of judgment? I could have been one of the disciples of Christ. How many people today have that opportunity and neglect it? He could have walked with the king of kings and the lord of lords. He could, have, he could have been called one of the... One, we don't even know this guy's name, but we would have known his name had he followed. He said to another, follow me. He says, Lord, let me go bury my father. Now this man didn't have a dead father that needed to be buried, but he had an aged father, more than likely, that was close to death. And he wanted to defer that call into a more opportune time. Well, I'll serve you, Jesus, uh, when things are a little bit more convenient. But right now, it's not convenient. How many people today, they don't, they, oh, yeah, I'm willing to serve you, Jesus, but not right now. 
let this happen or this happen. And there may be a couple reasons why this guy wanted to defer. Maybe when he's more financially stable, he'll, he'll serve the Lord. But no matter what the reason is, it boils down to really a lack of faith. Because you know what? If God calls you, He's going to equip you. Amen? And we have to be willing to trust Him. It could be that maybe He loved His Father so much and felt like His Father needed Him, which is admirable. But again, we have to trust in the Lord. And look how He responds. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go preach the kingdom of God. Now that seems like Jesus is just really insensitive, isn't it? Doesn't it? Jesus refers to his father as dead. Perhaps his father was unsaved. And even if he was saved, we cannot allow anything or anyone to stand in the way of doing what God's called us to do. Because the call of God on your life is much more important than anything else. Amen? What God, God's will must come before whatever we think is best for our own life. You know, I've resigned to the fact that God knows what's best. He can see the bigger picture. And I learned that we have to trust in Him. You know, we, if we're so busy fixing problems with our family members, right, they'll never ever see a need for God. If a parent doesn't allow their children to suffer the consequences of their own decisions, they'll never make decisions, they'll never make changes in their decision-making process, right? Thus dooming them to a life of, of, of problems. If we give our children everything that they ask for, how will they ever see a need for God? So oftentimes we think we're doing what's best for them instead of saying, you know, I'm going to follow you, Lord. I'm going to do what you call me to do, and I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of that. That you're going to take care of our children. That you will teach them. The thing is, is that, you know, sometimes, like I say, we're, we're so busy being God in our kids' life. And I'm talking about my children are a lot older. You know, they're grown adults now. But the fact is, is if they, if they always depended upon mom and dad, right, how, why, how would they ever see a need for God? And that's what we have to do is learn to trust. This man needed to learn to trust God, that God would take care of his father. But you know what? I'm going I'm to listen to you. I'm going to obey you. Lord. And another said to him, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, let no one having put his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, man, Jesus, he's just like I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's that hard. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead and say bye to them and then, then go. I mean, it would be, seem, to me, it doesn't seem to be a problem. But evidently, Jesus looked more, Jesus knew what was in the heart of this person. And if you look, if you look only at 60, the 61st verse, it would appear that all this person wanted to do is say goodbye to his friends and his family. But looking at Jesus' response, it doesn't seem like there seemed to be more to it. How many know that God knows us better than we know ourselves? And what He wanted to do, maybe, perhaps, is have one more fling with the world before He went to serve Him. This person represents someone willing to serve the Lord, but, you know, not right now. Let me just go have a little bit more fun before I go. This person has gone past the first. He at least counted the cost. And he understands what he must give up to serve the Lord. But he wants to have just a little bit more fun before he submits to God. It's kind of like a bachelor in today's society who gets married yet wants to have one more fling with another woman before he gets married. You must already be committed before you make those vows. You've got to be committed in your heart. Because if you're not faithful before, you'll never be faithful after. Lord, I will follow you, but let me go bid farewell to those at my house. And Jesus said to him, No one, 
having put his hand to the plow, looking back as fit for the kingdom of God. How many people pull back from serving the Lord because of their families? Family people, well, they'll say sometimes, oh, why do you, why do you go to church so much? Why don't you stay here to, with me today? Why do you give all your time and money to that church? You know what? Charity begins here at home. But I want you to look at Luke 14. And this is a really difficult saying of the Lord. This is difficult, but these are Jesus' words. I'm not picking somebody else's words for us to talk about today. But these are Jesus' words that we cannot neglect. And look what He says. If anyone comes to Me and does not... What does He say? Hate his father and his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and sisters. Yes, his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That word hate that he uses is misio in the Greek. And by extension, what it means is to love less. If you love your family more, you will constantly be conflicted in your service to God. Many servants of the Lord have had to separate themselves from their family because if they didn't, they would undoubtedly bring corruption in. You have to be willing to follow Christ everywhere He goes. And, and the thing is, is that He's not saying that, Jesus isn't saying, well, if you just don't, hey, if you love your family more, you will always listen to them and you'll never truly... Because he's not saying that I'm going to exclude you from being my disciple. What he's saying is the God's honest truth that you can't be because you will always put family before God. And he says if you're going to be my disciple, you have to not only deny that, but you have to deny your own self. And you've got to pick up your cross and follow Him. Now that's not easy. And I think, you know, as narrow and difficult as the way that leads to life, right? Broad and wide is the path that leads to destruction. Now, these are hard sayings. But I would be remiss if I, wouldn't, if I, if I never preached on these. People, I know that I've had to separate myself from people in this life. And, you know, they may see me as being self-righteous. They may see me as just a nut. But you know what? I don't care. I just simply don't care. Because I only have one judge. I only have one judge. 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. I cannot care what man thinks. My concern should be more on what God thinks. Besides, we have a mandate from our Lord and Savior. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17-18. He says, Therefore, come out from amongst them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are called to come out from amongst the world. Because it's the world that brings in that corruption in our lives. It's corrupting our church. We, we have allowed the world to corrupt the church more than the church has made a difference in this world, and in America anyway. And it's time that we stand firm and say, you know what, I'm turning the world off. I'm going to listen to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Willingly following Christ means that we have to separate ourselves from the things of this world. Now back in Luke 9... And another said to him, Lord, I will follow you everywhere, but let me go bid farewell to them who are at my house. But Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In the 62nd verse, he, he says this. He says, no one having put his hand to the plow, looking back. I like that song we sang, no looking back, no looking back. If you're looking back, you know what? You can't see where you're going. Yeah. Right? You know, look at Lot's wife. Lot's wife looked back and ultimately was destroyed. Luke 17, 32 through 30, he says, Remember Lot's wife, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. See, when you put your hand on the plow, when you've counted the cost, when you make a commitment to put your hand to this plow, there is no looking back. 
There is no looking back. And he says that it's not, you know, is looking back is not uh, fit for the kingdom of God. That phrase, looking back, could mean directional. It could mean that. But it also means regret. It could also mean regret. It's hard to live in the here and now if you regret what is lost. It's hard to move in the future if you're filled with regret of the past. Here is a person who's much like the first, right? Remember the first? He offered up. In the 57th verse, Jesus said, He said to Jesus, He says, I will follow you wherever you go. This one says, I will follow you. Jesus didn't call either one of these two, but these two, these two made this decision. They said, I will follow you. The second one, Jesus actually did call and said, follow me. But this one wasn't quite ready. Maybe he was waiting for a more opportune time. Maybe put others before his call of God. The third one, again, you know, looking upon himself to, to come to Christ, he took it upon himself. He says, Lord, I will follow you. But Jesus knew he wasn't ready. That looking back, he would, it would make it impossible for him to remain on the straight and narrow. I want you to notice that in all three of these, and it's, this is interesting, all three of them, guess what they all did that were in common? They all called Him Lord. All three of them called Him Lord. Makes you wonder how many people today call Him Lord and never really committed to Him. How many today? How many have really ever counted the cost? How many want the benefits of the kingdom without the commitment to Him? Because who in their right mind, if you go up to them and say, Hey man, just accept Jesus, say this prayer, man, you're going to get wealthy in this life, God's going to bless you, and you're going to go to heaven for all eternity, and best of all, listen, you're not going to go to hell and burn. Who, do, who, isn't, who isn't taking up on that? Nobody in their right mind that truly believes will say, yeah, I'd rather just go to hell. Right? Nobody's going to do that. So people, they want the benefit, but they don't want the commitment. They don't want to take what it, what it takes to follow Him because they're afraid what it might cost them. It's okay if I just bring Jesus into my life, you know, and, and, and get the benefit of it, but don't tell me what to do. Don't make me do what I don't want to do. Because let me tell you something, when you serve the Lord, you'll find that you end up doing things that you may not want to do. It may cost you more than you want to pay. At the Olympic Games in Paris in 1924, they, had, uh, they introduced this uh, sport of canoe racing. And uh, the, the favorite to win that was the USA team. And there was one guy that was on that team named Bill Havens. Uh, and, and this was the first, as, as the time that the Olympics were coming near, and like I said, it was back in the 1924, his wife was fixing to give birth to their first child. And uh, he was, and at that time, they didn't have these jet liners. I mean, the way to get over there was on a boat, and it was kind of slow. You had to go on a boat to get over there. And so it was just, he found himself with this dilemma. Should he go to Paris and risk not being there when his first child is born and being with his wife? And of course, he had worked so hard in his life to get to this point. Now his wife is saying, you know what? No, you need to go. But you know what he ended up choosing? He said, no, I'm going to stay. Well, guess what happened? She was late. He would have had enough time to get over there, do the race, and get back. And he would have had plenty of time. And you know what? The American team that year, you know, they did win the gold. They won the gold. And, and people, when they would hear this, they would say, what a shame. What a shame. But Bill had absolutely no regrets. He says, after all, his commitment to his wife 
was more important than, than winning that gold medal. Now there's a sequel to this story, because you know what? He ended up having a little boy. That little boy eventually grew up to be, uh, you know, uh, they named him Frank. 28 years later, in 1952, he received a telegram from, uh, from his son Frank, uh, where he, it was sent from Helsinki, Finland, in, in 1952, where they were holding the Olympics. And the cable Graham read, and I quote exactly, Dad, I won. I'm bringing home the gold medal you lost while waiting for me to be born. Isn't that something? The sequel, you know, the sequel of our acts of commitment, there are sequels to our acts of commitment as well. Our commitment to one another, our commitment to God, and all these things we may sacrifice here in this life, we may miss out on things. But we shall receive a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of joy and peace forevermore. You know, it, it's not easy serving the Lord. There are times where it's not easy. We, we build this up. And like I say, I would not trade my life for nothing. For knowing the Lord and, and for what He's done in my life. And although it has been difficult at times, I would not trade it for nothing. It's been the best life that I have known. And the fact is, is that uh, that even even with the trials, listen, no matter if you serve God or not, you're going to have difficulties in this life. Amen. You're going to have difficulties in this life. I would much rather go through those difficulties with my Lord and Savior than not go through them, or go through them without Him. And so the, the point here is that, listen, there are many people who call Him Lord. There are many people who will readily jump and say, yes, I, 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 I'll... I'm ready, but you have to understand, you've got to count the cost to truly serve Him. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you everything that you were, everything that you are, and everything that you will ever be. Because your life is no longer your own. We have been bought with a price. We have been bought with a price. And it's, take, it, 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 it's considering those costs and the question I want to ask today is, are you willing to follow Him? Now, I know many people may say, oh, I've already made that decision a long time ago. Ask yourself, have you truly committed to serving Him? And are you doing that? Let us pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word today. Lord, I know that there, there are things in Your Word that are difficult, difficult sayings. And Father, I just pray that those who hear this message today will take it to heart. That Father, we can't ignore, we can't just look at the good, the good words and the good sayings and neglect all of them and neglect the ones that we don't want to hear that may seem difficult. But Father, I pray because I would much rather know now than to stand before you in the day of judgment and not have been known. I want to know now, Lord, that I might correct the path that I'm on. Father, I know that there are others like me who, who want to know the truth now before it's too late. Father, I pray that you would lead and guide us, that you would bring your conviction of the Holy Spirit into our lives, that you would guide us on the paths of righteousness for your name's sake that you would transform us into the image of the Son of God, that you would transform us into who you called us to be, that you would give us the strength and the ability to accomplish everything that you've called us to do. I thank you, Father, for your words. I thank you for uh, everything. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.